Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Tronson. I'm a licensed therapist here in Orange County, California, where I specialize in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder and body dysmorphic disorder. Now, every Wednesday, sorry, every first and third Wednesday, rather, Dr. Liz McInvale and myself uh, run a live stream. You can see it at 9 a.m. Pacific or 12 noon Eastern. And it's called Ask the Experts. This is where Liz and I will answer all of your questions live. So if you watch the uh, live stream live, you can go to iocf.org forward slash live, or you can go to uh, Facebook, uh, IOCF's Facebook live um, and other platforms. You'll see that on the, the iocf.org forward slash live. And you can submit questions live and Liz and I will answer those. Additionally, people submit questions at iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind. And these are the pre-submitted questions that we get. And I'm answering it today in a special edition of OCD Mailbag. But today it's going to be all about body dysmorphic disorder. So um, I am also uh, an individual with body dysmorphic disorder. So I was diagnosed with that and, and, and struggled with that for many years. And so after I got better, I wanted to become a therapist, went to school, got licensed to treat both OCD and BDD. I'm also one of the leaders of the Body Dysmorphic Disorder Special Interest Group at the IOCF. I'm a vice president of OCD Southern California. We're an official affiliate of the International OCD Foundation, and I've just been named to the International OCD Foundation Board of, of Directors. So I'm here representing a lot of hats. I'm a, uh, one of the IOCF's also uh, lead advocates. So I really enjoy these live streams. I wish they were around when I was struggling, but that's why we're here to answer your questions and to offer support. So if you like today, make sure to go to one of our live streams or submit one question. So today I'm gonna to be doing it all about BDD because uh, we got a bunch of BDD questions and I figured I'd just do a special BDD Ask the Experts edition of OCD Mailbag. So I'm gonna jump right into your questions. The first question is, the talk on body dysmorphic disorder was very interesting. I think my daughter has it because she spends a lot of time in the mirror and always talks about the things she hates about her appearance that her mom and I do not see. Could this potentially be BDD? So what I like to do is slow down and let's go to the the, the um, specific criteria, the diagnostic criteria of BDD. So it's where an individual is fixated and obsesses over a either minor or perceived flaw. Perceived means that they feel like something doesn't look right and other people don't see it. Or it's so minute, like a small scar that they feel is huge, the other person doesn't see. It's typically the neck up, doesn't mean always, and common areas can be feeling like your nose is too big or bumpy, your teeth might be too big, your skin has horrible acne or redness or discoloring or people don't like the feel of it, uh, feeling like you're losing your hair or obsessed with the, the way your you know, hairline is. It can also be on the body, so sometimes it's feeling like your calves aren't proportionate to the rest of your body or your left bicep is smaller than your right bicep and symmetry. There's, there's a type of body dysmorphic disorder known as muscle dysmorphia, where an individual feels like they're not muscular or large or strong enough. So that's the first kind of criteria. The second criteria is that because of that perceived flaw, you consistently come up with repetitive behaviors to make yourself feel better. That might be mirror checking or complete mirror avoidance, comparing yourself to others. It may be camouflaging with makeup or hooded sweaters, uh, asking people if they see it repeatedly, looking close up in the mirror, taking pictures and videos and zooming in to kind of see that. It may be avoiding going on Zoom, talking about the appearance you don't like a lot. And then lastly, it's, does this cause distress in your life? So in your question, it sounds like BDD without meeting um, your daughter. She talks about things she hates about her appearance. So individuals with BDD don't like their appearance. Sometimes they feel like they're not put together properly. They feel disgust, shame, guilt around their appearance and hate it. So that we see that in, in your question. You don't see it. And that's a big criteria in BDD because if other people do focus on their nose and make fun of those nose when they're kids or people make comments often, it doesn't mean that the person deserves that or shouldn't get help or treatment or therapy because they're feeling very low about their body image or self-image, but they don't find, uh, fit the criteria of BDD. She spends a lot of time in the mirror. We see that with grooming or just checking in the mirror. So what I would, what I would recommend is going to iocdf.org forward slash find help and find a therapist that specializes in BDD in your area. 
I will say a lot of people will put BDD down, but the treatment is a lot different. It's much more components than just OCD treatment. So you can always ask how many of their, cl uh, their clientele, how many clients do they see that has BDD? And hopefully they'll uh, refer you to somebody if they don't see BDD themselves. But the first step would be to get a proper diagnosis and then to start on treatment. The second question is, how can I tell the difference between just not liking my appearance and having BDD? Good question. The, the, I'm going to kind of blend two questions because another one is, what is the difference between body dysmorphic disorder and body dysmorphia? So somebody not liking their appearance is body dysmorphia. Now, that's not a clinical term. It will not be found in any diagnostic criteria. The DSM, which I have behind me, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses, you're not going to see that um, in the DSM at all, uh, mental disorders rather. Um, you're not going to see clinicians typically using it, but it's a colloquial term that society's kind of created. And not liking your appearance and body dysmorphia typically is like you look in the mirror, you don't like your hair that day, or you feel like your hair is frumpy. Maybe you feel like you've gained some weight and feel uncomfortable in a bathing suit. So it's more typical dislike of body image. A big difference I see between that and body dysmorphic disorder is body dysmorphic di disorder doesn't shift. Most of the time, people aren't like feeling great and attractive for seven days in a row, not liking their skin one day and going back to liking it. True, sometimes with BDD, we might move on to body parts. We might hate our nose for years and then switch to our skin or our teeth. But there's a constant dislike of appearance, whereas body image or body dysmorphia, that's where we're going to see somebody not liking their, their appearance for a period of time. Maybe it's something other people see as well. So they feel like they've gained a lot of weight and other people are like, yeah, you know, unfortunately, over the pandemic, you have gained some weight. Um, so other people are going to see it too. It typically does bring on sadness and unhappiness, but typically we see somebody with body dysmorphia or body not liking their appearance, still being able to work or go to school, et cetera. When you look at the research on individuals with BDD, the part of their brain that registers appearance, actually the wrong hemisphere lights up. They fixate on details. They don't see the holistic part of their image. They don't make eye contact with themselves. They're scouring around and fixating on flaws. They see something as hideous and deformed when it's not. I mean, it, it's a very serious disorder. So that's the last thing I'll say about it. And that's what why body dysmorphia doesn't have the last D and body dysmorphic disorder does. When something's a clinical disorder, it means it's causing absolute havoc in their personal life, their social life, their school life, et cetera. Now, the good news is it doesn't mean if you have body dysmorphia or don't like your appearance, you shouldn't get help for it. And in fact, most of the time, somebody who treats body dysmorphic disorder like myself, we have more than enough tools to give you proper uh, treatment. So somebody who treats BDD can treat body image. It's not the other way around. A therapist that really helps people, you know, find self-confidence and feel better about body image is not going to be trained to treat body dysmorphic disorders. So that's the most important reason you want to make sure you have the right, you know, uh, diagnosis. The next question is I skin pick. Any advice on how to stop or what to do? My skin is really bad because of it. Now, I always want to say there is skin picking. It's called excoriation disorder. Nobody uses that, but skin picking disorder is what everyone says. A BFRB, which is a body-focused repetitive behavior, typically hair pulling or skin picking. If somebody skin picks because they're either anxious or bored, they get some pleasure from scraping, that's not going to be under the BDD criteria. This question, it sounds like, is because of BDD. So typically what people do when they have BDD is specifically around their skin is they find themselves kind of feeling around for any acne or they might look in the mirror for it and they don't like it. So I was a skin picker because of BDD. So because I would see pimples, that made my body image horrible. And because of BDD, I used to blow them up in my head. I thought my whole skin was terrible, even though it wasn't. I used to take an acne pad, I'd take tweezers and kind of scrape my skin. People use all different kinds of things. So if it's someone because of, of BDD, it's because they want to change the appearance and texture of their skin because they feel like it makes them look terrible. Now, as the question asks, what happens is it's a horrible cycle because you do that and typically you cause worse acne and sometimes scarring, et cetera, on your skin. So then you get anxious and you do it over again. What sometimes can help, which was in my case, is seeing a uh, dermatologist and, and, you know, having them give you some tools and things like that to make sure like, you know, let's say you are having some small breakouts, 
medicine for that instead of kind of going in and operating it yourself. But also we want to reduce behavior that leads to that. So for me and for most of my clients, we're going to get out of the mirrors. We're going to stop kind of feeling for bumps. We're not going to go immediately and like have our nails long or sharp objects to pick. We want to reduce and eliminate that behavior. And often what we see is then we stop the cycle, the skin heals, and then there's no reason to pick. But definitely you want to approach that with your therapist who specializes in BDD. All right. And then the last, oh, there's two more um, BDD questions, rather. Uh, the next question is, I have body dysmorphic disorder. How do I stop ruminating about my side profile? I think about it all day. So there's a lot of strategies that we want to get with BDD. So one is called perceptual retraining. It focuses on training the way that you see yourself in a mirror, videos, and pictures. There's a really good video. I think it's called USA Science or maybe it's not USA science, it's something science, but literally the title of the video is people with body dysmorphic disorder see themselves differently than others. The reason that video is very important is it shows that does eye tracking software and it shows what happens when you look in a mirror when you have BDD versus somebody who doesn't have BDD. So somebody who doesn't have BDD kind of makes eye contact in this triangle like eyes and top of nose. Somebody with BDD is looking all over the place and that's why they see themselves differently and they spend a lot of time fixating on the part of the face they don't like. So what many people do is they'll take pictures, videos and look in the mirror at their side profile then they'll immediately scan to the parts of their face they don't like and they'll bring on very negative judgment of that. So as a clinician, I'm going to work with my clients to A, reduce the mirror checking to only essential reasons. So let's say you're brushing your teeth, washing your face or something like that. So it's an essential reason. The second thing that we're going to do is when we do essentially look for a reason in the mirror, we're going to make sure to make eye contact. We're going to see our whole self and we're going to maintain that eye contact. So instead of hyper-focusing on the part of our face we don't like, and lastly, we're going to switch over to objective language versus subjective. So no more, my side profile looks terrible. My nose is hideous. My, you know, my, my neck fat is disgusting. People are going to feel miserable after that. And the BDD is going to flourish. So it's making objective observations. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to focus on other aspects of ourselves that has nothing to do with our appearance. If we're spending all day focusing on our appearance, it's typically because we think that nothing will change unless our appearance is fixed. And that is not accurate and is not true. So we want to focus on other things that you can engage in so your mind isn't constantly about it. And lastly, what really helps with rumination with body dysmorphic disorder is to start looking at it with cognitive restructuring. So it's asking yourself, where did these thoughts come from originally? What is proof that these thoughts are even accurate? How are you like, you know, fostering these thoughts to continue? Are you fantasizing about plastic surgery? Or are you imagining how much better your life will be if your face is fixed? Let's get some logical thinking in there, some cognitive structuring. So that way, the way that you talk to yourself is much more impactful. It's much more helpful versus being so maladaptive. So all of this is a process. And, and I would say the biggest thing is we don't have to listen to every thought in BDD. We don't have to answer every thought. and We don't have to pay attention all day. We can say, look, I don't like my side profile because I have BDD. And I've been staring at it and judging it for the last five years. So of course, I don't like it. So when I go out today, I'm going to focus on the conversations I have, the friends that I have, and I'm not going to run to every mirror and look at my side profile. That's just going to make me feel worse. So we want to start to talk back to the BDD, show them who's boss, make sure that we're not uh, driving it with behavior. All right. So the next question is, I'm hoping you will have a talk on BDD. That's what we're doing right now. And how parents can learn to interact with their teens and young adults with BDD. So how do we support a young adult child with BDD? who are making concerning choices as a result of the disorder? And second, how do parents respond to the BDD-driven comments about their appearance? To answer the second question first, if a loved one comes to you and asks for reassurance, we want to make sure that they have some psychoeducation first. And psychoeducation is a fancy term for having education and understanding about BDD and its components. If they're seeing a therapist and they have education, then that response is going to be a lot easier. What I mean by that is you'll be able to tell that loved one and say, look, do you recognize the questions that you're asking me as seeking for reassurance? And if I was to answer that question, it will only give you a temporary sense of relief. You probably won't believe me anyways. You'll think I'm just saying it because I love you and I'm your mom. And it's going to give the BDD attention. It's going to give it an audience. And 
it's going to validate that your concerns are wrong. And I mean, concerns are valid and that you need to get reassurance um, or, you know, or else, right? Now, if somebody doesn't have the education, et cetera, you may need to take a softer approach because the person doesn't understand the disorder in the first place. So what you can answer to them instead is you can say, look, you know, we've been looking up body dysmorphic disorder and part of the disorder is asking a lot of questions. I think you want me to answer the question and make you feel better. But in BDD, that actually feel, that actually kind of, you know, enhances the disorder. So we're looking for a therapist or we're finding a workbook for you or we're looking at these live streams. It's better if I don't answer those questions that may make it worse. We want to foster like, auto, you know, autonomy. And we want to make sure that the loved one knows that you don't care about their appearance. That's not why you have the relationship. We want to take the the weight off of appearance, right? So if we're answering appearance-based questions, they're going to think that their appearance is super, super important. The, the first part of the question is, how do we support a loved one with BDD who's making concerning choices as a result of the disorder? There is no specificity about what those behaviors were, but typically what I see is, um, you know, sometimes it's constant mirror checking, et cetera, right? But sometimes it's looking up plastic surgery, wanting to get fillers, wanting to get uh, dental cosmetic surgery. It's wanting to get plastic surgery, things like that. Sometimes it's very risque behavior. So a lot of times people with BDD may either avoid any kind of like sexual or romantic contact. Sometimes as a reassurance token, people do it constantly because they want to get reassurance from somebody that they're attractive and they feel like, you know, if somebody's willing to have sex or, or romantic uh, relations with them, it must mean that they're attractive enough for that. So what I always come back to is if your loved one doesn't know that they have BDD, your young adult, they're not going to see this as a problem. They're going to feel like it's absolutely essential for survival. Once somebody gets the education, which is the first step in BDD treatment, they will start to understand that they see themselves differently in the mirror, that they're really, really, you know, um, susceptible to societal messaging about appearance, that they're looking at social media and comparing incorrectly. You got to do the perceptual retraining, the cognitive behavioral therapy, the exposure response prevention. You got to start looking at what other things do they value and are important to them so they can foster that. And then looking at underlining issues that enhance the BDD, such as childhood bullying, trauma, et cetera. So it's a process. And what you want to do as a loved one is really start to support the person in getting help and getting treatment versus supporting some of this reckless behavior. I always think what the best thing to do is to find out how does your loved one intake information? Are they into podcasts, TV shows, YouTube videos, et cetera? Find videos. The IOCF has a great BDD website. I believe it's bdd.iocdf.org. Um, or you can go on the IOCF uh, website and click BDD. There's a lot of really good information, videos, books, podcasts, et cetera. And you can find which one of those best speaks to them and have them start to you know, engage in that to learn that what they are going through is not an error in their appearance, something going on in their mind so that they'll be likely to get treatment. That's how you can best support them. Once again, if I didn't answer the question that you, you know, if you, if you wanted me to go in more depth or you feel like there's other questions you have, always remember you can go to iostf.org forward slash peace of mind. There you can submit BDD related questions. You can also uh, hit me up on my social media. It's at Chris Tronson. I'll, I always answer like Instagram DMs or tweets at me for sure. My email is Chris Tronson. So my name at gatewayocd.com. You can email me or join us live at one of the live streams. So Liz and I do the live streams every first, third, fourth, if there's a fifth Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 uh, noon Eastern, and I'll answer more of your questions. But thank you so much for your questions. Hope this edition of the BDD OCD Mailbag was helpful for you, and I really appreciate And uh, make sure to go to iscf.org for anything you may need. Thank you.